From 12 News, your local election headquarters, this is Newsmakers. The biggest surprise on election night in Rhode Island may have been just how early the races were called. Dan McKee has won the race for Rhode Island governor. Here at 12 can project Seth Magaziner has won the second congressional district race. With GOP hopes high, especially in the second congressional district, many expected closer contests, but Republican hopes were ultimately dashed. You know, I'm just, you know, just disappointed, but you know, life goes on. And the governor's race was a landslide. And we're just getting started. Thank you so much, everybody. We have complete analysis on the red wave that wasn't in the region and nationwide and what all the results mean for Southern New England, a political roundtable this week on Newsmakers. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White in the final 22 election season <laughs> political roundtable. I'm joined by 12 News political uh, editor Ted Nisi and political analyst Kara Cromwell, Lisa Pelosi. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. It's good to have you once again. <laughs> we should put you on the payroll. You hear so much. Um, all right. So I told you to me what the biggest surprise of the night was at the top of the show, which was just how early Ted and Joe Fleming uh, were calling the races that night. I mean, I think however you felt the races were going to go, many people thought they would at least be tighter than they were, which would mean a later night. It wasn't that way. What was the biggest surprise for you, Lisa, on election night? Uh, I thought this was the year for Republicans, and I thought at least one Republican would win in the general office or maybe even the congressional delegation. And to see that not happen, and then to see in other communities no Republicans winning, I just don't know. I thought the moon stars and everything were aligned this year for the Republicans, and it didn't happen. You and, and Republicans naturally felt that way. Carol? I mean, kind of along the same lines was McKee's number. I mean, mm. he just crushed. Um, and, you know, his folks always say, don't under underestimate Dan McKee. And I think a lot of people did. Yeah. I was expecting it to be much closer. Huge margin. Ted, biggest surprise? I, I, along the same, same lines of uh, Lisa's point, and not even just the Republicans getting slaughtered in Rhode Island, but in, in Massachusetts, I looked. Uh, Bristol County Sheriff Tom Hodson, who'd survived for 25 years, even he couldn't hold on this cycle. And I looked him. This is the first time in modern history that Rhode Island and Massachusetts have elected a Democrat to every single statewide and federal office. There's always been an outlier, a Charlie Baker, a John Chafee, uh, someone in the in the governor's office or a U.S. senator somewhere, and now they're, they're gone. They yeah. are just out of office other than at the very, very local level. And that is, even after all the years Republicans have been in decline in this region, that's still, I think, a historic marker. Yeah, Ted wrote a great analysis piece on that very topic. You can catch it on WPRI.com. Actually, the Washington Post picked up Ted's uh, piece on, on Friday. Friday. Yes, very nice. Well, it's a coin flip. Do we start with the governor's race? Do we start with the second congressional district? Because there's so much to talk about. Let's start with CD2. Let's take a look at the final results from election night in the race to replace Congressman Jim Langevin. And here they are. Seth Magaziner, uh, he had 50 percent. Alan Fung, 47 percent. And moderate uh, William Gilbert garnered 3 percent. You know, I caught up with Magaziner on election night. Uh, my colleague Kim Kalunian caught, caught up with a crestfallen Alan Fung. Let's take a, a short listen from each of them. How are you going to get things done if you are in the minority party? Well, uh, as state treasurer, I worked across party lines with Republicans and Democrats to get good bills passed here in Rhode Island. And I hope to do the same in Washington. I mean, you know, it's no secret that I have some significant disagreements with the Republican leadership in Washington. Uh, but that being said, I've always believed that we have more in common as Americans than we have different from each other. And so, you know, we try to find those areas of commonality and work together to benefit all Americans. I'm not going to second guess anything. All I can say is, look, we, I'm proud of the campaign we ran, proud of the people that were, you know, uh, came out for us, proud of the team that we had, best team that, you know, I've had, you know, running, you know, with me, by my side, and, you know, I'm just, you know, just disappointed, but, you know, life goes on. Tough loss for Alan Fung, uh, three three election cycles in a row. Of course, he ran for governor unsuccessfully uh, twice in Rhode Island. But looking at Seth Magaziner, what was the key to victory for him, Lisa, do you think? I think in the end, and I think we saw it th during the debates, that linking of 
voting for Alan Fong is a vote for Kevin McCarthy and the radical leadership team that he would bring in and what that would mean in terms of Social Security, Medicare, um, health care, Affordable Health Care Act. So he kept banging that issue over and over again. So Alan to win needed to have more than just the Republicans obviously vote for him. He needed the independents and Democrats. And then in the end, when they were weighing both Seth versus Alan, they thought, hmm, if I vote for Alan, I'm voting for that whole team. I'm not comfortable with that team. I'm going to go with Seth. Yeah, Kara? I, all of that, and I think Seth, Seth had really good institutional support, right? He had, you know, primary, but then all the Democrats came together. Organized and labor. Organized labor, everyone. They came home and they got behind him. I think that, you know, I mean, it, it didn't, it, I would say it didn't hurt Seth that his um, opponent was weighed down by national politics, but it definitely helped that he had good grassroots support here at home. Yeah, I, I, two things, uh, and again, probably kind of overlapping. One is I, I give a lot of credit. The Magaziner team always talked about how much they were going to uh, fight to have a good ground game. I think you saw that. The turnout in Warwick was crazy high, mm -hmm. um, which granted, there were lots of things going on in Warwick. There was the school bond referendum. There were general assembly races. But I have no doubt the Magaziner team was a part of why so many voters were coming out in Warwick, and they, they worked hard to do that. Um, they, they talked at times about Fung might win the air war, meaning have more TV ads or whatever, but we're going to win the ground game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we're going to win on the ground. And then the other thing was, I, in retrospect, and I, I admit, you know, a winning campaign always looks brilliant and a losing campaign always gets, you know, <laughs> yeah. all their mistakes are said. But right. I do wonder whether Alan Fung, as much as he would talk about, I'm not some Washington Republican, you know me, I'm from Rhode Island. I don't know, maybe he didn't put enough meat on the bones for voters, more specifics about, you know, he'd say, oh, I support this, like the bipartisan infrastructure bill, but that was very widely supported. Things that were more bigger differentiators, like a Susan Collins up in Maine, who voted down, you know, killed the Obamacare Republican. repeal and stuff, a Republican, you know, she takes stands that get her a lot of heat with the party. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Alan Fung ever went quite that far. And I, Yeah, and I'll take it a step further in saying that he should have cut the cord mm -hmm. and said, you know, thanks, Kevin McCarthy. I don't want you to come to Rhode Island. I was going to ask it. Was I that put a that hat on by accident. But then would all the money have been cut off? You're fine. Fine. You need, the, you need to win the votes. And you need money to, to get the votes. But you have to make a choice. He can deal with the, the issues he's created when he gets to Washington. But by, you know, being ambivalent, I don't think he gets there. And... You know. do, you, do you think yeah, it was a mistake I, that Kevin McCarthy came? I think it's a mistake that he came, but even worse, that Kevin McCarthy put that picture of the two of them out on social media. So when we think about pictures, we talked about Alan wearing the Trump hat, the Kevin McCarthy photo, that lingered in people's minds more than everything that was said in the commercials is yeah, that picture. Yeah, I remember. And, you know, there was I had this feeling all through the campaign that Alan Fung um, I don't want to say he was being used, but you know they they were they they, they loved, were eager. The National Party yes. wanted yes. Alan Fung and to win. Repeated, Absolutely. Repeatedly, when a National Republican was coming to Rhode Island for Alan Fung, how did I find out? Because the that National Republican would leak it to Punchbowl News, the most insider publication in D.C. Right. And then I'd say, who's coming to Rhode Island? Kevin McCarthy's coming to Rhode Island. Jason Smith's coming to Rhode Island. And they'd ask the Fung campaign, and they wouldn't write back because they don't want you to know that these people are coming because it's not helpful to him. That's why I was I was shocked when Kevin McCarthy mm -hmm. put that picture just because, again, it's New England, and there might be Republican viewers watching saying, it's fine to be with Kevin McCarthy. It is, except it's not a vote winner around right. here. Not, right, not if you're looking to get undecided voters. If you're trying to secure the Republican base, absolutely, invite Kevin McCarthy here. But guess what? The base is too small to get you elected. Mm -hmm. so I wonder if there was a lot choice. of discussion in the Funk campaign, do we tell Kevin McCarthy not to come here? And that, that'd be a pretty hard thing to do. The, the House Minority Leader, likely next speaker, hey man, we can't have you come But in here. fairness, then Fung went to Wyoming for McCarthy's right. uh, donor retreat the same week Liz Cheney was going down in flames there. I mean, just, there, was not, there was not a big effort by Alan Fung, at least behind the scenes, to keep his distance the way uh, Charlie Baker always, Charlie Baker never voted for Trump in two elections. You know, he, it took a lot of heat. It, it might have been part of why he couldn't run for a third term. Um, and Ma Susan Collins up in Maine wrote op-eds about why she wasn't supporting Trump. Right. That brings you a lot of heat, but it also very much defined them as independents in the eyes of an electorate in their home states that did not support Donald Trump. And leaves you um, available for those undecided voters who are, you know, weighing these things. And Alan, I think, had such a good reputation as somebody very much like Baker, who's into you know getting good government things done as a mayor, right? Mm -hmm. And I think he could have played on that more and pushed away the national stuff, just very much like Charlie did. You know, we knew Kevin McCarthy wanted our seat because it was Democrat for so many years. So mm -hmm. it was really kind of a flag to show, look at the turn in the, in the country going forward, you know, to say that we can turn Rhode Island from blue to red. 
But in the end, it didn't help Kevin McCarthy having a picture with Alan Fong. I mean, how mm. does that boost him at all? But it hurt Alan by having that picture out there. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they wanted to be able to say the red wave washed ashore in blue Rhode Island. That's right. And they couldn't they Yeah, couldn't they get thought, I mean, the Republicans thought they were going to start the night saying, look, we won in New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. Because he also was over with George Logan in Connecticut, yep. Kevin McCarthy, who also lost. So I think, yeah. you know, I just think, I, I, and again, I, I don't want to pretend I saw this coming. I think like most analysts, I thought we were going to have a red wave or at least a strong Republican night, even if you didn't all the way Maybe like a wave. ripple? A ripple, something, maybe, <laughs> a a, you ripple. know, a pond. But, um, <laughs> you know, it really... You really have to look in the mirror if you're a national Republican right now and say, what are we doing that a president, this a Democratic president, this unpopular, record high inflation, and we might not even win the Senate? Well, let's go back locally on this race, though. I mean, our last poll that we did in this race was a month ago, or a month before the elections, I sh should say. And Ted, the, the poll, our poll, and I believe the Globe's poll, had Fung at 46%. Mm -hmm. That's about where he finished. And that we now know that was his ceiling. A very right. a very smart Fung supporter said to me around the time those polls came out, he says, you know, I still feel good. I think this is, you know, I think we can really win this. But my one fear is what if we can't build those last couple percentage points? Mm -hmm. You know, what if he's he's got that 46 locked down, but he's not going to win with it. And he needs that 47, 48, 49 to win. And that's what happened, right? It, it seemingly Alan Fung didn't lose any of the sport he came into October with. But those last couple points who weren't with, who probably knew Alan Fung by the time of October between the previous races in this weren't with him and Seth Magaziner won them over decided no I they probably had been voting for Jim Langevin they're gonna keep it in Democratic hands you know what was so surprising about all this is because the polls and before the polls in the June I think too also had Allen up so we were going into it thinking all right Allen's ahead so here we got closer to the election, and I know the way you do, we talk to people. And how many people did you talk to say, oh, I'm really in favor of Allen, but I'm not going to vote for Ashley? So we knew mm -hmm. that there were going to be split tickets of people, Democrat, voting for Allen. And in the end, that number wasn't strong enough to pull them over the finish line. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when Democrats came home. They said, I'm not voting for Ashley, and I don't think I'm going to vote for Allen. Either. And I also, I think, I will, again, it's, uh, you know, I know it was the, the magaziner folks were sort of frustrated that the cover of the journal on Thursday was a mm. picture of Alan Fung <laughs> instead of a picture <laughs> yeah, of them yeah. after right. they'd done all this work and actually won the race. But, you know, <laughs> it did appear in the final week, Seth Magaziner worked his tail off in this race. I mean, he was everywhere. He was <laughs> he's skinny as a scarecrow by the end of it, I think. So I don't know if he, no matter how many pizza joints he went to with his family <laughs> during the campaign. Um, you know, he worked very hard. And he knew why he was in this race. He, it was clear in our debate. It was clear when you talked to him. He he wasn't just spouting consultant lines all the time. He really believed in the need to block Kevin McCarthy and company because of January 6th, because of what happened after the last election. Well, and a lot happened since the public polling. There were a, a series of debates, including mm -hmm. here in Channel 12 and another one on Channel 10. Those are the live televised debates. Magaziner performed well in those, and they tweaked the Magaziner campaign, tweaked their messaging, I think, a little bit, and that clearly made a huge difference. We're going to have to go to a break pretty soon, but Lisa, I got to ask you. Yeah. You know, uh, particularly as we're going to shift in the second half of the program to talk about the gubernatorial race. You work for Governor Lincoln Almond, yeah. Almond Republican governor here. What do Republicans need to do moving forward to, to start winning? They need to have a really candid, self-reflection type of conversations with themselves. And they have to decide, do they want to win or do they want to hold on to the ideology of the strong right views on, on certain issues? If they don't want to win, that's fine. But you have to look at the numbers here in Rhode Island. But by just voting Republican, the Republicans won't. It's not going to bring you, it's not going to win. You need those independents and Democrats. So what do you need to do to be able to say, I can accept a candidate who Republican says, I'm pro-choice. Lincoln Almond was pro-choice. John Chafee, who I worked Alan with. Fung. So, but but yes. Alan Fung was as well, and it didn't work. I mean, is this truly, and we'll get into the second half. I know we have to go to a break. <laughs> is this truly about Trump just weighing down the party? I see it right now. I still feel it. It, that's it. Yeah. There's not much you can do about that locally, right? I know. I, mean, I know. <laughs> it's, it's that specter that just it's doesn't go away. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I also think, though, you, you have this issue where as the Republican Party shrinks in these two states, um, Charlie Baker experiences, there's a smaller and smaller group of people who are still 
capital R Republicans, which means, you know, we've seen this civil war in the Massachusetts Republican Party between yep. Baker, the most popular governor in the country, and the chairman of the Republican Party has been doing everything he can to undermine him. And now they've handed the governor's office to the Democrats. If Baker had won for a third term, he'd probably have won. Mm. And there's no term limits there. Yeah. Um, but the Republican rank and file, many did not want him, including their chairman. And now the entire state's in Democratic hands. All right. We do have to go to a break. And for people at home wondering why Ted has a laptop here, it's because we don't have Joe Fleming, uh, <laughs> who would have all the numbers we're talking about up in his brain. Joe is under the weather. Unfortunately, he can't be here for our final political roundtable. He has been a cornerstone of our political coverage on 12 News. He has schooled us on all things Rhode Island politics. <laughs> <laughs> He's an asset and a friend. He's, he is indispensable to us oh at gosh. election time. And it's so funny on like election night, I'll be staying there with him and we'll talk. I'll, I'll mention, you know what, Joe, I don't even think we ever seen this before. He's like, no, Ted, in 76, <laughs> well, this one person beat this person exactly. in West Warwick. And I'll, I believe him. So. <laughs> and you always like to jo uh, joke that he started polling and doing analysis for us when? The year I was born. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, Fle Joe Fleming. Feel better, we miss you. All right, when we come back, we're going to break down that uh, gubernatorial race that really dominated a lot of the airwaves as you are at, at home watching this election season. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. From 12 News, your local election headquarters, this is Newsmakers. Do you think it's time for new leadership in your party? Well, I think, look, I think we're going to have new leadership in our party anyway. I think uh, there have, you know, I think... Uh, you think Speaker Pelosi is not going to uh, well, seek leadership? I think, you know, obviously that's a decision she's going to make. But I think she indicated last time she ran that she would run for two terms. I think also she indicated that this attack on her husband is something she's going to take into account in terms of her recovery. So that would not surprise me. You've heard it. There's been a lot of talk of um, people seeking younger leadership in your party. Do you agree? Yeah, look, I would have always been uh, one of the people in our caucus who have pushed hard for more opportunities for more members. We have extraordinary talent in the Democratic caucus. One of the things I think we have failed to do is really maximize all of that talent effectively. Welcome back to Newsmakers and this political roundtable, the final one of election 2022. Ted Nisi, Kara Cromwell, Lisa Pelosi for this uh, political roundtable. I should note that interview that I did with the congressman was before we, uh, we knew that Democrats would punch above their weight uh, nationally. And we are taping this program on Friday morning. Many of you watch it on a Sunday. So there might be some developments, you know, in the direction I mean, of the House. As we tape it, there is still an outside chance they could keep the House, which the fact that we're even contemplating that is extraordinary. Yeah. I mean, it is. Bizarre. I mean, if they take the House, they take it doesn't matter if you take it by one or you take it by 50. Nope. <laughs> it, it is what it is. But I, wanted, I do want to shift over to the uh, governor's race now. Governor Dan McKee against uh, Republican challenger Ashley Kalis. And here are the results. Governor McKee, a resounding victory. 58%. Ashley Kalis took in 39% uh, uh, of the vote, a much wider margin than many predicted here. And now the governor declined to give interviews on election night. Uh, I was at the graduate, or as many know, at, at the Biltmore. So I want to play a little reaction from him on the podium. And then our Steph Machado caught up with Ashley Kalis. So I took two phone calls tonight, one from my opponent, who congratulated us on our victory. Yeah. And just a few minutes ago, from the President of the United States. And the President said that he's with us here in Rhode Island. We wished the Governor uh, well on his next term. Listen, not every losing candidate has uh, such a conciliatory message. Why was it that you wanted to make sure that you said that up there? because it's the best thing for Rhode Island. We all need to hope that the governor does well because that's what's good for Rhode Island. You know, Ashley Kalis, who had been throwing haymakers uh, throughout the campaign, gave a very gracious speech at the end of the night when she conceded uh, that race. And again, as we talked about at the top of the show, Ted, that race was called so early. This was not an issue of money for Ashley Kalis. She dumped in $4.7 million of her own money into this race. If you do the back of the nap napkin math, she paid $34 per vote. Um, so it wasn't a money issue for her. Why did she fall so short? Or if you want to answer the question a different way, why did McKee just do so well? Lisa, what do you think? Well, I'll start with her. And I think she started in a hole. 
Me, you know, when she announced, people did not know who she was because she was not from Rhode Island. And that was a constant theme that he, um, the governor, played very well, that she's not one of us, that she doesn't have our Rhode Island values. So she had to really establish herself to begin with. She had the money. She spent the money. She got on the air early, which was good. She tried to define who she was. But what happened here is what we see that happen over and over again. He was really an incumbent, even though he was not the elected governor, he was the incumbent. And she had to tell people not only why not to vote for him with the ILO, the FBI, and whatever, but why vote for me? And I was expecting more of that to happen after the September 13th primary for her to come out here and say, here are my you know, strong policy issues. This is what I want to do. Make you feel comfortable to come over and vote for me. And she didn't make that case. Or she, I think she tried, right? I mean, she did, she held a couple of events. She did the education. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, in retrospect, look, she, I mean, first of all, we, I had no idea she would be able to pour $5 million almost into this race, which is an extraordinary amount in Rhode Island for yes. an unknown who, mm -hmm. who only moved to the state last year, right? It's just a, a, a not something you expect. I, uh, I do think when you look at the numbers, you, you think, okay, yeah, the, the basic seeming flaws in this candidacy were apparent. Like, someone who had moved to the state last year only registered to vote in the state in January of this right. calendar year. Um, she always tried to kind of dance around that fact, would say, oh, I always wanted to come home. But there was no she's evidence. From she's yeah. from Massachusetts. There was no, you know, and she'd say, well, that's very close, or my husband lived here. Um, and then also, you know, all, all the damaging reports that came out about, you know, police reports emerging about her, all these lawsuits and litigation. And then on top of it, being a Republican in a uh, year that turned out to be much closer to a blue wave than a red wave, especially in New England. I mean, she, her, the first interview I did with her back in March, she said her model, I asked her what Republican governor was her model. I thought she'd say Charlie Baker, because mm. that's the natural answer. And she said Ron DeSantis. Ron DeSantis. Mm. Nothing yeah. against Ron DeSantis. He won a thumping victory of the night. But again, not necessarily the kind of image these moderate New England Republican governors usually go for. So just a lot of questions about her candidacy, even though I think her campaign ran a pretty smart campaign despite those vulnerabilities. They were very aggressive. They were always trying to get earned media. Um, and then, of course, you have to give a lot of credit to the McKee team, which ran a very good campaign. Yep. Okay. Well, money can't buy love. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to say it. I mean, you, she could have dumped probably another $5 million into the race and still not won. So um, you, I, I truly don't think you can move to Rhode Island and run for governor. It's not an entry-level job. I mean, bottom line, and Rhode Islanders aren't going to one day wake up and be like, oh, sure, that woman from Illinois, but yeah, she's really smart. If she were a Democrat, she might stand a chance, <laughs> but she's already in the hole, yeah. you know, being a Republican and having a base that is 35 percent, we'll mm -hmm. say. Um, so I, I think she could have spent a lot more money and still had the same result. I mean, that's true. I mean, if you run as a Republican in Rhode Island, you're you're just putting your name on the ballot. As you say, you're going to get 35 percent. 35 percent. And so... Are you saying that she spent five million dollars and four percent? Yeah. Well, Tim, she, I just to, yeah. not to rub it in, but you know, look at the returns. She got thirty-nine percent spending about five million dollars. Pat Cordalesa, the Secretary of State right. nominee for the Republicans, got forty percent, a percentage point more than her. I think he spent three thousand mm. dollars. Yeah. He's from Rhode Island. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Bottom line, yeah. it, you, somebody has heard of you before. Somebody has known you before. It's not this idea, and and. You know, she is a lovely woman. She gave a lovely concession speech. But there is a little bit of um, hubris to arrive on our shores with your big bag of money and think you're going to be the next governor. But here's the problem that the Republican Party had. Who else could they run? So at the time, we thought Blake Filippi might consider right. it, and he backed out. Um, Scott Avedesian, we talked about him. Perhaps, you know, he didn't want to run. Alan Fong decided to go to congressional race. David Darlington, who worked with me in former Governor Ahmed's office, flirted with it for a little bit, didn't. Who did we have? So then you bring someone in, a strong businesswoman, self-finance, you know, willing to do the hard work. If we didn't have Ashley Chaos, who else would have the Republicans had? They wouldn't have had a candidate. You're yeah. absolutely right. And, yeah. and, and at some point in time, the party needs to look at, you know, and I think this is the next step for them, to take a look at what their what the future holds and yes. is it you know do we dominate locally but who do is, we retrench but, who, but there's the problem who is the party because mitch mcconnell Absolutely. donald trump and ron desantis aren't going to sit They're down with Rhode brian Island's newbury party. steve yeah. frias etc right. and say and barbara and fenton fung and say all right who who is this party going to be because right. they are just there is not an alignment between what national and this has been more and more true since like gingrich right maybe even since goldwater depending who you ask mm -hmm. that the incentives for the national Republicans to be a more conservative 
party anchored in the South. Um, there are lots of states, Ron DeSantis won by 20 points the other night, right? There's lots of states where that is working. It does not work well in New England. And, you know, I think for a lot of national Republicans, exchanging New England votes for Florida votes, for Sunbelt votes, is, is a good trade. But that leaves the Republicans here who have the brand shared with them and then are constantly trying to say, well, we are Republicans, but we're not those Republicans. I mean, ask a Democrat in Alabama these days. Right. It's the same problem in reverse. All right, well, we have about a minute left. So 20, about 20 point margin of victory for Dan McKee, massive, massive. Uh, job well Huge. done by the McKee campaign. Is this a mandate for Governor Dan McKee? What oh, I think he comes out of this with a lot more political capital than yeah. people yeah. expected. And I think it's going to be interesting to watch. The governor set a big uh, right there in his victory speech, he said, we're going to mass match Massachusetts or exceed them in education. A huge mm -hmm. lift yes. by 2030. But but clearly, he's going into this with some ambition. He's like, I'm not the accidental governor anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm the governor. I have a biggest mandate since Bruce Sunland in 92. I'm very curious to see how he does it and how he maybe reshapes his office and his staff to execute that. And education reform has seconds. been his thing this whole time. So I'm sure that he has the um, the, the background and the ability to do that. All right, well, Lisa, 10 seconds. Uh, and he has to build a strong cabinet. Now that he's in for four years, he should be able to, and with those raises that he's proposing, <laughs> he should be able to attract strong people. Well deserved for most of them. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, uh, look, it's been a fun season. Uh, for all of you, thank you very much for taking your time and joining oh, us on News and Makers. Uh, Lisa Pelosi, Kara Cromwell, Ted Nisi, of course. I don't know what we're gonna do next week. Sleep, <laughs> but we'll see you next week on News Makers. I want my t-shirt.